when your sight is off, your ability to receive will be off. You must be willing to go through the fire and be tested, and not just once and not just twice, but however long it takes. So once the problem is identified, the focus should be on the solution and not the problem. A lack of really truly trusting God is what brings that panic. Don't say what God is not doing. Say what he is doing because you see and you know you're covered. See, sometimes people see the wrong thing. They, they see incorrectly. You don't want to receive something that is not of God. So when your sight is off, your ability to receive will be off. Even in a service like this, many of you have your sight on Jesus Christ, the moving of the Holy Spirit, you're able to receive. You're able to receive because your sight is right on Christ. Your spirit is open to everything he has. But if your eyes are on flesh, if your sight is off, you are limited with what God can literally do, not because God is not able, but because you've blocked him, and therefore you've said no. If you want to walk in your high calling, you must be willing to go through the fire and be tested, and not just once and not just twice, but however long it takes. And you're not going to be afraid of the fire because God is with you even in the fire. We've already gone over this. We talked about this the last time, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So once the problem is identified, the focus should be on the solution and not the problem. Jesus is the solution. Amen? Amen? Your gift will be tested. You go, oh, that's a gift. Well, your gift will be tested. You don't need to turn there, but I do want you to write it down. 1 Corinthians 3.13. Because the fire will test your gift. The fire will test your gift. But you're going to come out like pure gold. You're going to come out of the fire like pure gold. Now, our, like I said, 2 Kings 6 and 12, starting in... In 12, this is, this is what we're going to talk about today. There was a king, okay, and there was a prophet. The prophet of God, his name was Elisha. And he knew what was being spoken by his enemy, even when he was not around. Okay, he had a prophetic gift. He was a prophet, and he knew what was being spoken, even when he was not in the presence of those that are speaking it. Right? Okay, let's, um, let, let, me, let me go ahead and... Start to read here a little bit. I'm actually going to start in verse in verse eight. In verse eight. So now the now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, and he said, "My camp will be in such and such of a place." Now let me tell you, unless you know you can make your plans, but unless God directs your steps, you're not going to amount to anything. You're not going to go anywhere, right? So now, this was a wicked king, and he thought he was making his plans. Well, he was making his plans. It's just that God was going to ambush his plans. Amen. Amen? So he says, my camp's going to be in such and such a place. He's, making his, he's setting his plan. And the man of God, that would be Elisha, sent to the king of Israel, and he said, beware that you do not pass this place for the Syrians are coming down. Here you go. You see him reading his mail, though he was not present. But he was reading his mail. So the king sent someone and he says, you know, who is it that is leaking information? Verse 11. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled. And he said, and he called all of his servants. And he says, will you not show me which one, which one of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, who's a traitor in this camp? Who's letting this information out? And verse 12, his servant said, none, my Lord, none, but, O king, but Elisha the prophet, who is in Israel, he wasn't even present, he tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. He's not present, but he knows exactly what you're saying because he's gifted. It's a gift, right? Right? So the king says, well, go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. So he goes and he basically sets out to go 
and basically make life difficult for Elisha. But when you are a child of God and you're literally walking in according to the word of God, no matter what assignment comes against you, your eyes are going to be fixed and focused on Jesus. And so therefore, you're not going to allow the, the threat of the enemy to attack your heart, your mind, your soul, or your spirit, right? So Elisha, he was a man of God that was on fire. That means you too are to be a man or a woman of God on fire. Because you know what Elisha and Elijah, we know what it says in, in James, uh, that Elijah, which came before Elisha, right, that he was a man like you and I, right? And he had faith that God would do what he said he did. And he says, the same faith that he has, you have too. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You guys remember that prayer, right, in James 5? Okay, well, we know that Elisha basically studied under Elijah, right? And so this man was full of faith. And what are we to be full of? Faith. So we got a king. An enemy king, and he's mad. Why is he mad? Because his plan was exposed. I'm making this as plain as I can make it. He's mad because his plan was exposed, and not just by anybody, but by the prophet of God. So he decides he can't let this happen. Look with me in verse 14. So he sends horses and chariots and a great army. And he came by night and he surrounded the city. So they set up their plan of attack at night. And they surround the city with horses, right? And, and, and with chariots. They surround this city. And when the servant of the man, not Elisha, his servant, when his servant, he got up early and he goes outside and he sees horses and chariots and he panics and he goes to his he he's he's um his servant said to him he says master what shall we do so he's all worried because he sees with his natural eyes he's seeing the wrong thing he is focused on the the battle the the natural the battle he is focused on what the enemy is doing if you are a seer and you can see demons, that's great, that's wonderful. But if that's all you can see, that's not good. If you can see the demons, but you can't see what the Holy Spirit is doing, then you still need prayer because your eyes are still blocked. You need to be able to see what God is doing and not just what the enemy is doing. Of course he's up to something. He roams around. We know what the word of the Lord says, seeking. He's literally seeking whom he can devour. He's a, he's a lion roaming around. Of course, he's up to something. But God, but our Lord never sleeps. He never slumbers. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. And he's always on time. And he always has the upper hand. Amen. So we have to be able to see the right thing, right? And you can, we're going to find out what Elisha said and how he prayed. We need to pray the same way especially when we're seeing the wrong thing. Can't see correctly sometimes. So he says, what should I do? What should we do? Look, we're surrounded. We're surrounded by these, you know, the, the horses and chariots. Verse 16. And so he answered, do not fear. This man of God was a man of prayer. He wasn't, well, let me first pray for an hour and a half. Let me get in the spirit. And then let me tell you what the Lord said. He is a man that was always in prayer. He was a man that was ready with the answer. Guess what? That's what we are to be as well. Ready at all times. Being in the spirit. That's why the Bible says to pray continually. Let me tell you, people go, oh, well, that's not possible. You need to be able to, um, you know, there are times you're in the flesh. Well, you're not supposed to be in the flesh. You're, you're literally supposed to let your spirit man rise up and be active and grow. It's a choice, though. Some of you are looking at me like, yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, that's the look I'm seeing. Some of you are looking at me like, maybe that's easy for you, but it's not for me. That's not true. It's not easy for anybody. If you think it's easy, it's not easy for anybody. There are times it's not easy. Of course, there are times it's easy, especially in an environment like this. But there are plenty of times it's not easy. But it's still a choice, and it's actually the right choice. Okay, so he says to him, he says, do not fear, for those that are with us are more than those who are with them. He already knew, because he could see, those that are with us, you're looking at the little, 
You're looking at the little um, war and the army that is surrounded, but there is a greater war and that, and there's a greater, there's a greater army. That greater army is actually for us and not against us. You're so focused on the little army that is against us, but you failed to see the greater army that is for us. He tells them this, right? And he says not to fear. Because the enemy's tactic is always the same. He always wants to get you to fear. But God says, trust me. Trust me in this. Trust me. Keep your finger right where you're at in 2 Kings. But we're going to go over to Psalm 27, verse 3. It says, though an army may encamp all against me, my heart shall not fear. You shall not fear. Elisha's servant was fearful. But God's telling you right here, right now, don't fear. Right? Even though you see a whole army around you, encamped around you and against you. Though war may arise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired. One thing. This is what you're confident in, that you're committed to Jesus. He says, one thing that I have desired of the Lord, I will seek. That will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord. To inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, it comes to everyone, church. For in the time of trouble, he says, to hide me in his pavilion. He will hide you in his pavilion. He will hide you in the secret place of his tabernacle. He will hide you. He will hide you. He will set you high upon a rock. He is setting you high. And now, he says, my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Glory to God is right. Above my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Glory to God. He says, I will sing praises to the Lord. Whenever the enemy tries to encamp all around you and you can feel the fear, you can, you can see his assignment. God is the lifter of your head. God is literally going to cause you to see that assignment. But I'll tell you, if you're, just, if you're sitting there going, yeah, well, yeah, well, let's see if God does it. Let's just see what he does. Let's just, you're being resistant. You're being resistant to the Holy Spirit. And God says, I want, you to, I want you to partner with me. I want you to say, Lord, if you said it in your word, then it's mine. I'm going to take it. I'm going to walk in the fullness of this word. If you expect God to do it all for you and you're not going to lift a finger, in other words, you're not going to let your faith rise up. In other words, you're not going to be active. You're not going to say, Lord, your word says it. So if I am not in agreement or my heart isn't quite there, my faith isn't quite there, the only person that is at fault would be me. Lord, rep I repent of a lack of faith. I repent, Lord, of having resistance. And I literally say, I'm clinging to this word. If you said it, so be it. It's mine. And that is how you let the, and that's how literally how you kick the enemy out and you say, Lord, it's mine. I'm walking in it. I'm walking in it. I don't care what you see in the form of the enemy's attack all around you. There is a greater picture to be seen. There is a greater victory, and God wants you to walk in it, but you have to do it. So that fear that grips your heart, that, that uh, it, may, it may be fear, it may be something else. It, it just may be depression or, or like you're, maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you're so frustrated because it's like no matter how long you see everybody else moving in things that you're believing for, and it's not happening to you yet, and you're getting frustrated. Well, that's anger. And you know what? God's timing is perfect. And you're not the one that gets to judge as to how long long needs to be. You're the one that needs to say, I'm sold out. I'm sold out to you, Jesus. And Lord, because I'm sold out, I will say yes and amen no matter how long it takes. And that's what God is looking for. So back to verse 16 of 2 Kings chapter 6. He answers, this man of God, this prophet, he says, do not fear. Do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then... Elisha prayed and he said, Lord, I pray. He said, open his eyes that he may see. Simple prayer. Open his eyes that he may see. That's your prayer. That needs to be your prayer. Lord, open my eyes that I may see. What are all these people getting so excited about? Why are they so excited every time they gather in one of these services? They are so excited. It's as if they start seeing things. I don't see anything. What are they seeing? What do you mean they're talking about angels and the glory? And why are they singing the same word over and over and over? What are they seeing? What are they experiencing? Ask God to open up your eyes. Because as for us, he's already opened up our eyes. He's opened up our heart. He's opened up our emotions. And we just want more. We're not going to stop. You can't taste of the glory and think, oh, that's good enough for me. You just want more. You keep on being drawn in by the power of God. Amen. So literally he says, Lord, Lord, open up his eyes that he may see. Simple. 
Simple. Let your prayers be simple. And then the Lord opened up his eyes. He opened up the eyes of this young man, and he saw. He saw what was there. He saw what everybody else was seeing. He saw what Elisha was seeing. And behold, the mountain was full of horses. The mountain was full of chariots of fire all around Elisha. Though the enemy may encamp all around you, the Lord is setting an ambush to them, and the Lord is encamped all around you with far, far greater. There, is, there are chariots of fire all around you, ready to protect you, ready to take you to a whole nother level. You just need to say, I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. Say it again. Say it over your spirit. I trust you, Lord. No working of the devil will be allowed to come against what God is doing in my life because I'm partnering with Jesus and my eyes are on him, on Christ. My eyes, I will look and I will see and I will receive because my beloved is for me and not against me. Amen. So there's like a level of really tasting and seeing and, and your faith gets activated and not to allow discouragement and things that have happened in the past to take that first place. Right? That, that's what we have to do. That's what we get to do. It's our job to keep our eyes on Jesus. I'll tell you, immaturity will cause panic. Immaturity causes panic. But a seasoned soldier knows how to keep their eyes on Christ and knows that that is the secret to their success. Immaturity causes panic. Your panic may be quiet. Your panic may not be you yelling and screaming and running around as speaking fearful statements. Your, your panic may look different, but it's still panic. It's still opposite of trusting God, right? So immaturity is what brings the panic. A lack of really, truly trusting God is what brings that panic. But God takes care of you, even if that's you, and you go, that's exactly where I'm at. Well, today's your moment. Today's your day. And just say, Father, I guess there's some immaturity in me, but I don't want to walk out with that. I want, to, I want to exchange that. I'm not going to have that in my life. No, I'm going to expect for greater things. I'm going to move, and I'm going to believe God for greater things. I'm going to activate my faith. I'm going to speak when I need to speak. Be silent when I need to be silent. But I'm going to allow the Spirit of God to move through me. I will set my sight on the right things. I will set my sight on what Jesus is doing. And I will receive the fullness of what God has promised me. Even there, I may see rebellious children, children that are bent on doing their own thing. Maybe it's a spouse, but they're bent on doing their, their own thing. But I'll tell you right now, you're not going to focus on that. You're going to see beyond that. You're going to see what God is doing. You need to see what God is doing. And how do you do it? You ask God, open up my eyes. Amen. Open up my eyes, Lord. This is exactly how this prophet, this man of God prayed for his servant. And God opened up his eyes. And when his eyes were open, he saw the provision of God. The provision was always there. He just didn't see it. The provision for you is always there. You just don't always see it if you're not focused on it. But is the provision there? Absolutely. Because God is the provider. And, he, and he's never going to go against or go back upon his word, right? He doesn't do that. So the provision is always available to us. Amen. Amen. Now turn your, turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Because if God be for us, who can be against us, church? If God be for us, who can be against us? And that's what this word starts off with here in verse 31. It says, what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? You need to have that committed to memory. And you need to let that word come forth out of your mouth. If God be for me, who can be against me? Because your own faith will start to rise up. You're, you'll, you'll, you'll start to become that mighty, mighty warrior, that soldier. And basically, you're telling the devil, oh, no. You may have, allowed, you may have been allowed to harass me in the you know, yesterdays of my life. But as of today, going forward, you are defeated. Because if God be for me, who can be against me? See, so you start realizing that the price that Jesus paid for you is literally fully paid. And you get to walk in the privileges of what he's already paid for. He's already paid for your freedom. Look at verse 32. It says, for he... Who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Say freely. freely. He gives me all things. Me all things. Freely. freely. If God is freely giving you all things, but you don't 
necessarily walk in all of them, you can't see them in your life, then where's the problem? Because he's freely given them to you. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? That's you. You're his elect. Who shall bring a charge against you if you're his elect? Nobody. The Bible says no one. It is God who justifies, right? Who is, who is he who condemns? Is, it is Christ who died, and furthermore, it is also, he's also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us? I love that. Christ at the right hand of God is interceding. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress Shall persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For it is written, it says, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, even so, it says, in all these things, though there's tribulation, though there's difficulty, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You are more than, you are more than a conqueror through every hardship that you endure. You are more than a conqueror through Christ, and you got to know that. Amen? Verse 38, for I am persuaded, that means fully convinced, totally convinced, confident, believing this word. I am persuaded. If you're persuaded, you can't, you can't, you can't, you're not going to change your mind. You're persuaded. It says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything created shall be able to separate us, separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You're not going to be able to be separated because God is not going to, he is with you. He is for you. And this is your mind. You're mine. Amen. And he has you covered. He has you covered. So, number one, we need to know our sight must be on what God is doing. Amen. As I mentioned already, if you can see what the enemy is doing, and that's where you stop, okay, you need to go press further because yeah. the enemy wants you to see what he is doing, and he doesn't want you to see what God is doing. Amen. He doesn't want you to see what God is doing because that's where your faith is going to grow. Right? So, so your walk needs to deepen, and you need to ask him, open up my eyes to see what you're doing, Lord. Yeah, I can see. I can see sickness. Yeah, I can see. I can see division. Uh, Lord, I can see. I can see relationships that are not where they need to be. I can see um, um, just fighting, anger, division in the home. I, I, we can see that. We all can see that. But when you ask God to show you, What's not naturally visible, but is present, because God is present at all times, right? It was already there that when Elisha prayed for his servant to have his eyes opened, the provision didn't have to arrive. It was already there. So the same is true for you. But when you ask him to open your eyes, you'll see what's literally present, already present. It's there. And when you see it, then you agree with it in faith and go, oh. That's what God's doing. So I'm claiming that. I'm claiming that. I'm going to stand on that. And, of course, the enemy doesn't want you to do that because that's when you're, he doesn't want you to see what God is doing because that's where your faith grows. Okay? Not only does he want you to see what he is doing, he also wants you to know that you're covered. Okay? He wants you to see. He wants you to see. And, and his provision is already present. I already made that point. It wasn't like God had to say, hey, I'm so glad you asked that prayer. Now let me get this done for you. It's done already. That's not God. It's already done. Amen. We just have to ask. Yeah. And when we ask to see, we're going to see, then we're going to walk in faith. But he also covers us. Okay? He also covers us. He will cover you with his feathers and with his wings. Under his wings, you're going to find refuge. So turn to Psalm 91. And 91 and starting in verse 4. It says, and he shall cover you with his feathers. Guys, this is, this is the word of the Lord unto the saints of God. And that's who you are. Your saints, your saints, saints of God. He shall cover you with his feathers. And under his wings, you shall take refuge. It means your safety, your protection, your shelter is under his wings. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor 
of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the, of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Notice how they're all present. Yeah. Notice how all these things are present. You're just not going to be afraid of them. People go, yeah, but this is what's happening. Well, they're going to be present. You're just not going to be afraid of them. Yeah, but what's happened is there, the arrows flying by day, pestilence by night, destruction at, at noonday. You know, um, husband got fired. You know, bill, bills, bills, bills. We're being evicted. They're present. These situations are present. You're just not going to be afraid of them. Oh, it takes a shift in your faith in order to grab a hold of this. But it's what we're required to do, though. Because God says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So it's possible, right? But we have to have our eyes to see and also remember, he's covering you. Then he says, a thousand may fall by your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. It shall not, it shall not come near me. It shall not come near your children. It shall not come near your marriage. You have to be able to say this and know, no matter what you see, if you're not seeing correctly from the Lord's perspective don't say what God is not doing say what he is doing because you see and you know you're covered don't partner with a lie verse 8 says only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked oh he's going to let you see the reward of the wicked that is for sure because you have made the Lord who is my refuge even the most high your dwelling place this is what he promises you and if you don't have faith to take this then, then we need to really pray look at verse 10 with me please no evil shall befall you nor shall any plague come near your dwelling it shall not come near your dwelling. Why? Because his word says he gives angels. Uh, he gives his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Not because they're not going to be present. It's not because evil's not going to be present. But the angels of God are being released to literally keep you in all of your ways. You're going to keep your eyes on Christ. You're going to keep your eyes on what Jesus is doing. Knowing that you're covered. Knowing that you're covered under his wings, under his feathers. You're taking refuge. Knowing that as you do this, no, no wicked assignment, no agenda coming against you is going to have its place. It can't. It cannot. It only can for a believer that is not fully believing. And there are lots of them. So much of the church looks like the world and sounds like the world. And you have a conversation with them and they have no faith, lack of faith. The world is just falling apart. Everything is terrible. Let me tell you lies 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 because we know that God is faithful we know that God is on the throne we know that he's not done we know that he already wins we got the, we already read the end of the book so we already know that not only does God win we win we're victorious you're victorious but you got to come in agreement with that amen so as Elisha prayed for his servant his eyes to be opened pray Lord keep my eyes open on you not just that I see evil, but that I see what God is doing in the midst of evil. Of course there's evil. We already know he roams around on this earth, the wicked one. But Lord, show me what you're doing because you're always doing something. 